Hi guys, thanks a lot for uh, for coming out uh, to listen to our conversation. It's really good to be back. The last time I was here physically was in 2019. I took a class um, actually with uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. I did an infrastructure and markets economy with a really, really cool lecture and I had a really, really good time. So it's good to be back. Um, as Ricardo has said, he, uh, together with the Growth Lab, essentially the Namibian government, you know, sort of retained the services of the Growth Lab to help us think about economic complexity a little bit. And this is where this journey started um, uh, to a large extent as well. So um, I started working for the Namibian government in, in September 2020. To give you some context, uh, Namibia's GDP is anywhere between 11 to 12 billion US dollars on a good day. Um, our annual budget is about you know 2.77 billion. Um, what we spend is about 3.3, so you definitely have a deficit of 500 million US dollars or more. I'm giving you all of those numbers to get context of who we are. Um, countries are around two and a half million people. The size of the country is about two and a half times Germany's uh, size. So it's about 824,000 uh, square kilometers um, being shared by two and a half million people. And that gives us the dubious honor of being the second least densely populated country in the world which before this, uh, it was really hard to sort of see uh, the utility of that particular statistics, but it'll start to come to light. Um, so when we started trying to look at increasing the economic complexity of our country, this is basically something we were going, or we were looking to do with the growth lab, you know, what sort of new exports could we put together? Currently Namibia sort of exports uh, minerals to a large extent. So you'd think of uh, diamonds, uranium, some meat, some fish. So nothing too complex. We're not exporting Nokia cell phones just yet. Um, and then at the same time, services or tourism, right? So, so that was a Namibian economy in a nutshell. Um, and then we got approached by a big green hydrogen developer. I think it was October 2020. And we started looking into this whole green hydrogen thing. And we started working with the World Bank and they started saying to us, look, you are actually potentially very, very uniquely positioned to do something very special in this space. You have some of the best wind resources on the planet. We checked that with um, uh, various tools that we were able to access through the Bloomberg uh, um, new energy finance tools. And we saw that the capacity factors we could generate in Namibia, 55% or more, more than eight meters per second of wind meant you had a really, really interesting world-class wind resource, especially in this area. The solar was pretty good as well, uh, easily uh, north of 30% capacity factors in selected areas. It just so happened to be in the very same area. So typically Namibia has started to build some renewable energy potential around the country, but like small plants, right? So Namibia produces or we consume about four and a half terawatt hours of electricity um, and we import 60 to 70% of that. I know, right? Pretty sad. And we import a lot of that actually from South Africa right here and they produce a lot of that using coal-fired uh, power. Um, our biggest generation asset is up here in the north, uh, in the Ruakana uh, area, and it's hydro, right? And then half of our population, or certainly a working population, uh, work in the agricultural sector. So you can imagine you're very exposed to climate change, right? If you get hit by a big drought, you don't get enough electricity, half of your people are unemployed, and you have to pay very high prices for emergency power um, that you're importing from coal-fired power stations, which is acerbate climate change. Um, so that was sort of our reality. And then we tried to turn our reality into this. So after doing a lot of work in this area, we uh, essentially put together a fairly robust governance structure that I can talk to, to you guys in some detail. We went out to the world, we put out a global um, RFP, a request for a proposal. And we invited private sector developers to envision a future um, that had green hydrogen as a big part of that. Um, and we got nine proposals from six developers. And I'll show you one such project. But essentially, as we embarked on this economic diplomacy, we started actually getting a lot of interest from people who wanted to build projects everywhere. Um, we started unlocking interesting uh, grants and funding from larger economies such as Germany and the EU that wanted to partner Namibia on this particular journey. And this is where we are at the moment. We're envisioning about three hydrogen valleys. Uh, we're putting together a green hydrogen strategy and we're going to launch that at COP27. Um, and, and this is being done by, by McKinsey. 
Um, and this, I think, was a big part of the secret sauce. I think a lot of international players did not expect the government to organize itself um, as quickly as we did. There's a technical committee full of technocrats that essentially reports to a green hydrogen council. You could see my one of my roles is a green hydrogen commissioner, which essentially entails project managing this vision. Um, and then, of course, we're reporting to cabinet, and that's the ultimate decision-making body. Uh, and so once you started creating a, a certain amount of clarity, um, but also robust sort of governance structures, it just engendered a lot more confidence and a lot more people were willing to, to come and take the risk of, of developing in Namibia. So that got us, uh, you know, going on a really exciting journey. This is um, the project that is envisioned um, in the southern part of Namibia. Um, actually, the developers are online as well. So if you guys have really cool technical questions for them, we can ask them. Um, but essentially, this uh, in the beginning, this was envisioned as a 9.4 billion uh, US dollar project. We're now looking north of 11 billion, closer to 12. Um, you must remember the size of our GDP uh, when, when you're thinking about that number. Uh, and it essentially entails almost seven gigawatts of renewable energy assets, three gigawatts or so of um, uh, electricity, about 700 megawatt hours of battery. 70 kilometers or so of transmission lines, some pipelines. That is at the industrial uh, site with desalination at the front, ammonia synthesis at the back and ammonia storage tanks. You liquefy the ammonia um, and you then bring that off to a ship. This is a floating, uh, moi, uh, a floating boy mooring system. Get that into a tanker and then that goes off to your, to your client. At the moment, um, our clients are predominantly envisioned to be German. So two weeks ago, we were in Germany in Berlin, uh, working closely with their um, Ministry of Economic uh, Affairs and Climate Change. And there was a business roundtable where essentially we were introduced to prospective off-takers. This particular company, Hyphen, uh, is 35% owned by a German company as well called Enetrag. And so Germany and Namibia are working very close through economic diplomacy, trying to make this project um, come to bear. And I think Dan and I will, will get into some details around that as well. Some interesting features that obviously are really important for Namibians, um, full-time jobs, about 15,000, 90% of those should be Namibian employees. Now you have to know that the town that is uh, to host this project probably has a population of about 30,000 people. Um, so if you imagine that these uh, full-time employees have two or three um, uh, dependents and uh, most of them are coming from not the, and they don't live in the, in the town, you could double uh, the town's population, right? And these are some of the challenges I think that we would love to be working very closely with Ricardo's team to start really thinking about what does this project actually mean on the ground? What are the anthropological issues, socioeconomic, um, as well, of course, as techno-economic? But, you know, for example, what does Namibia have to do um, with our immigration policy as well? Do all of these skills exist? Um, and, and what would it take to, to bring in skills, but also accommodate them uh, in a manner that they thrive as well? Big local content, about 30% uh, local content. A big part of that is are the local companies' balance sheets big enough, right? Um, I think one of the examples the developer was giving was that the largest, develop, the largest construction company in Namibia, their, their order book is typically about 70 million US dollars. And um, this project might have an order book of about 7 billion, right? So we're going to need many, many of those Namibian construction companies to actually absorb all of these, um, uh, all of this, uh, uh, Capital. I think this is another very interesting one. The idea is that the project will produce about 18 terawatt hours, possibly more actually, because the project has been growing in size since then. Um, about four to five of those terawatt hours would actually be curtailed energy. And so we're looking into the possibility of capturing some of that and actually feeding that into the Namibian grid, um, possibly with a bit more of a dispatchable profile. And obviously that will require unique investments strengthening the grid, a new connection, um, uh, battery storage as well, possibly green hydrogen re-electrification units as well. And all of that will then obviously determine the price of this electricity relative to the imports that we get from South Africa. Um, we think they should be uh, cheaper, but we've commissioned two studies to do that. We think this project can easily produce electricity at two 
two cents a, a kilowatt hour. We pay nine to 12 cents a kilowatt hour for our imports. So there's an interesting opportunity there to get Namibia to be energy independent. Um, at the same time, if this is the first of many projects, you might actually be able to become an exporter of electricity, let alone the molecules off to Europe. I think this particular slide uh, was essentially just utilized to illustrate a point. The ambition and the scale of the project is too big for the Namibian government to do alone by a long shot. But once you start realizing that, you know, this was once we started economic diplomacy drive, this was Franz Timmermans in Europe. He's in charge of the EU 55 uh, and, and the EU Green Deal. Uh, you know, when we met him and he saw uh, the green hydrogen molecule on the cover of our president's socioeconomic recovery plan, they flipped, right? They were like, they couldn't believe that an African nation was thinking like that. And they were like, well, how can we help? How can we partner? And a lot of the progress we have made has actually come from just goodwill. A lot of guys are like, well, you know, they gave us grant funding to get pilot projects going, a scholarship project going, ETC. Germany is designing a very bespoke um, incentive uh, to bridge uh, the pricing of this product versus market price. And Dan and I will talk to you a little bit about that. The EU president is looking to sign an MOU with our president at uh, COP27. We can talk a little bit about that as well. The Egyptians and the US of the world have come to the party with uh, all sorts of different packages uh, themselves. I think this was without a doubt one of the larger programs we unlocked. It was 40 million euros grant funding from Germany. We've used some of that to get uh, a portfolio of projects, uh, pilot projects going in the Rongo region. We can talk about that as well. Uh, we're putting together the green hydrogen strategy with that money and, and we started a national scholarship program to start up scaling Namibians um, so that they can become useful members of this particular industry when it goes ahead. This concept, I won't go into too much detail, but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so I figured I'd show you a little bit. So the idea is, you know, this, this first two blocks here is where the hyphen project will, will take uh, part. That is the whole Tsao Kaheb National Park. It's 25,000 square kilometers. Um, and so the idea is that you might actually be able to do seven uh, to five of these projects in that area. You can think of the size that could mean from an economic activity perspective. But both the developer and us have envisioned the possibility of actually um, building these assets uh, using common user infrastructure like pipelines and transmission lines to share that product with the region, right? So it's not all about exporting molecules to Europe. It's about getting electrons into the SAPP and possibly um, molecules into South Africa at some point in time. And uh, the way we're envisioning building this pipelines and these assets is uh, in an open source manner. So once you start building the first one, future projects will exceed to actually plug into that first one, which will be overdimensioned to accommodate future uh, projects. And we think that could bring down the overall cost of the molecules, but it also increases and de-risks. It'll increase developer appetite, but it could de-risk um, uh, the overall um, uh, risk of actually putting projects in that area. And then we've done some numbers with regards to, is it easier to, to transport the molecules from the production area to the industrial area, or actually to transport the electrons? And I think some of you who might be uh, involved in, you know, climate change studies, ETC, you know, this particular project is actually being done in a, in a fairly biodiversity uh, sensitive area. Um, and so you want to minimize that footprint. So one pipeline versus many, many transmission lines, for example, might minimize the footprint as well. So these are all the sort of different things that we're studying. Um, and over the next two years, uh, the developer would be, would be sort of looking to study. So that in a nutshell is, is where we've come from and where we are. I think more interestingly is where are we going? Uh, so we are hoping to sign a feasibility and implementation agreement with the developer uh, in November. Uh, we, we should be launching our strategy as well in November. So hopefully that gives some visibility about future RFPs. And then the feasibility study is expected to take 18 to 24 months. Um, construction should then start in 2025. First production, quarter one, 2027, quarter four, 2026. Um, and the idea is that, you know, during that feasibility, we're going to ground truth a lot of these assumptions, including offtake price. You know, how is it that we develop this thing in a manner that is aligned with... Um, the IFC performance standards and equator principles uh, and many other variables as well. And we hope that some of you guys who are interested would be a part of that journey, hopefully through the growth lab or 
any other school that Harvard wants to deploy in order to help us figure this thing out. Um, not just uh, for the sake of Namibia's economy, but for the sake of uh, energy security for that region, and of course, uh, combating climate change on a global perspective. So hopefully that's enough of an introduction. We can get into a chat. That was amazing, James. Thank you. Can we go back to the very first slide you showed with the introduction? Because um, I was there uh, in 1999, and uh, I took a hike, actually. What people have to understand, these are the large, highest dunes in the world, and they're up to 400 meters high, which is really impressive. And they're just sand. But this is this dead valley where these dead trees when you're climbing, there's no sense of scale because there's no trees, there's no rocks, there's nothing for any sense of scale. So you walk, hike up these, and it's like walking in peanut butter because every take, step you take, you slide back three quarters of the way. So it's like uh, being on a stairmaster, you know? And you hike and you hike and you hike. I was with a friend of mine who worked for the U.S. He was a, he was a foreign service agent in, in Namibia at the, at the embassy, um, and. Uh, we got up there and we, we must have been hiking for an hour and a half or two hours. We were totally exhausted. And his wife and, and young daughter were, were waiting for us down here. And we got up to this ridge and we said, oh, there's the top. It's just ahead. We're almost there. We're just, we're so close. You know what? Let's go down. They're waiting for us. We'll just run down. And then it was fun because you run down this steep hill. You can do somersaults all the way down. And she said, we said, yeah, we were almost at the top. And they were, she was like, no, you guys like got up to here. You were like not even a quarter of the way up to the top of the mountain. So, so it was a little humbling, um, but it's a very beautiful place. Um, so James, this is an incredibly inspiring story. I mean, first of all, thank you for coming and telling us about it, but also, um, so climate change, as people know in this room, is the most unfair phenomenon I, the world's ever created. The U.S. has emitted 25% of the cumulative CO2, EU about 22%. Namibia has emitted zero, essentially, cumulatively. And you're going to suffer the impacts of climate change, even though you didn't cause the problem. It's fundamentally unfair. So the idea of countries like Namibia taking advantage of this, these green markets in Europe and other parts of the world, Japan maybe, um, is just incredibly inspiring. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, and then I want to bring, I'm sure people here have a lot of questions too. Let's start with the core issue here, which is the economic feasibility of the hydrogen. So some people think hydrogen is like a big, um, well, a big bubble. Um, there's lots of billions of dollars going into hydrogen investment, but there's no hydrogen market. You know, there's a single train in Germany that is running off hydrogen, and it frankly is obscenely expensive. So th there's a lot of people hoping that this is there are people you can read reports talking about how hydrogen is going to come down in price, but it's not there yet. And so for a real project that would go operational in 2027 or even 2030, um, the market that exists today is ammonia, not hydrogen. Correct. So, so let's talk a little bit about the real market and getting this financed. Maybe there's enough stupid investors that'll throw billions of dollars and get this built even if it's not economical that happens but in general that doesn't happen very often so so how are you thinking about the real market for hydrogen since it doesn't really exist right now and you know basing a 10 and 11 12 billion dollar investment um, in creating a chemical that for which there really isn't a, a global market for right yeah, very, very fantastic question, right? And um, it's it's deep, layered, and nuanced, right? Um, the first point is actually this is not our project, right? The Namibian government is not bankrolling this. So some other private investor sure. is bankrolling this. Um, the second thing I'd love to say is we've spent a lot of time trying to talk to and understand um, the potential market, the off-takers. Um, and they too are layered and nuanced, right? So they range from, you know, policy makers, so the EU or the German government. And their motivation is not purely um, always just uh, profit-driven. 
And, uh, you know, so for example, Namibia over, over the, the years, actually over the past year, has gotten a specific energy envoy from Germany. Uh, it's a man who's very passionate about Namibia like you. He used to travel to Namibia quite a lot. He was in retirement and then he heard we were doing this and he came out of retirement essentially. And he got hired um, by the German Minister of uh, Economic Affairs and Climate Change to help Namibia with this particular endeavor. And he is uh, the ex-German uh, uh, Secretary of State for, for Energy. Essentially, he's like the grandfather of renewable energy in Germany. And he tells us how when they started or when, yeah, when he was writing these policies, Germany had you know, single digit renewable energy um, uh, capability in its portfolio and how back then as well, there were so many things stacked up against them. And with policy, essentially Germany bankrolled the evolution of renewable energy of solar because they gave, Absolutely. right? And so today um, you've got them saying the cheapest gas they have is Russian gas. Okay. And they're saying that they've paid a significant price for that cheap price. Uh, so, for example, hydrogen from northern African countries might even be cheaper than hydrogen from further uh, south. But they're willing to potentially pay a premium for molecules that are coming from democratic countries that are ideologically aligned and that are deemed to be more stable and more predictable. I found that to be very interesting. I did not find that in any Bloomberg New Energy Finance report, right? Um, there's also a very special relationship between Germany and Namibia, and, and, and they're very willing Going to invest in that as well. Centuries, right? Centuries, yeah. It's why everything works in Namibia. Didn't find that in a Bloomberg New Energy Finance report either. And then interestingly, though, once you started getting away from the policy and makers who were really looking to de-risk, because it's an energy security issue for them, right? You know some of the things the U.S. has done in order to secure its own energy security. It wasn't always one plus one, like they did some very interesting things, right? So you get away from the policymakers and you start talking to the private sector players. Yara, for example, is one of the largest um, fertilizer manufacturers in the world from Norway, but have, they have a big terminal in Germany. And, you know, we had a chat at this round table and we said, so, you know, what price would you be willing to pay roughly? And spot today for ammonia is about 1400 Okay, it's that high because of extremely elevated gas prices, because of things that are going on in the world right now in Europe. Um, ammonia over the long term, two, three, four hundred bucks, right? The question is, when is it coming back down to that price level? And whom would you be? Because they used to source that predominantly using you know, natural gas from, from Russia. So there are all these dynamics that, that are very interesting to understand. And, and that private sector client is also willing to pay a premium. In fact, he actually threw out a number, and the number was north of a thousand um, uh, dollars, uh, euros landed uh, a ton, which I thought was fascinating. And then after you start talking to, to those private sector players, um, you, you then start to understand some of the mechanisms the policy players have put in place. Germany, for example, has put in place a carbon contract for difference uh, called the H2 Global that will be looking to source hydrogen and hydrogen uh, equivalents at the lowest price possible that is made from green hydrogen, find a, an off-taker within their market. So say, for example, they'll pay four bucks a kilo for green hydrogen and the private sector player is willing to pay two and a half. And the $1.50 they've put aside, it used to be a 900 million euro facility to bridge the two with a contract, uh, contracts for difference with auctions on both sides. They upped that after the war by 3.4 billion. So that's now a four and a half billion euro program that they've put. Uh, and what that does is it gives the producer a 10-year off-day contract. And it gives, of course, the consumer security of supply. So that was very interesting for me. Um, and then on top of that, you start thinking about carbon taxes uh, and where Europe is going with that. At the moment, uh, you're looking at 50 euros um, for, for carbon taxes, but, but that's going up. Some people are saying 80, 90. So when we looked at all of that, we saw an interesting opportunity, right? It's not a slum dunk, but we saw an interesting opportunity. We started engaging with those governments, and then we essentially went to the private sector players and we say, does anyone want to take a strategic bet or a risk uh, to develop these assets with those offtakes? This developer is 35% uh, German. Um, they are, they've been operating with green hydrogen in Germany for, for more than a decade. 
Um, and so, so far, we're seeing a lot of interest at these price levels. Because in theory, you know, H2 Global at these prices is actually not needing to come in, right, at 14 price, 1400 spot. And it will only need to come in when you start delving below. I mean, this project they're looking at, like you said, 800, 900 uh, a ton. And so how long does that take? Three, four, five years? What sort of economies of scale could you then start unlocking uh, down the line once you start doing the second and the third and the CUI is, is getting taken over? So it, it's a dynamic conversation that is ongoing. As I said, James, it's an inspiring story. And in some ways, very, um, I mean, really, truly inspirational. I, I do think, though, of some other examples of large industrial projects that just make me pause for a minute. One example, very different type of project, is a project called Pearl in Qatar. Uh, Shell invested what they thought was first going to be $10 billion. It turned out to be almost $20 billion building a gas to liquids facility because Qatar has lots of excess natural gas. They don't have the capability to ship it overseas and sell it. They have so much natural gas, they don't know what to do with it. So the effective price locally is 50 cents uh, an MMBTU. So Shell and the government collaborated on this $20 billion, what turned out to be a $20 billion project to convert gas to barrels of synthetic fuel, which they could sell at a liquid fuel price in tankers for around the world. Um, Many companies, big oil companies, think Shell made a huge mistake and that it was an incredibly risky bet. It turned out it worked out for Shell, but there were a lot of people throughout the process. Company, $20 billion bet is a big bet. And that was with oil where there's an established market and you know, you have at least some sense there's, it's volatile, but you know, just like the, the ammonia market um, here, but, and, they, and they believed they could make a synthetic barrel of oil for $35 a barrel, which was lower than the long-term average price of oil. Here you're talking about making a product. I know it's not you, it's the company making a product for roughly double the average price historically, you know, half of what the, or less, whatever, substantially lower than the current price, but the current world is a strange place. Um, and, and it makes me think, you know, um, these developers, incredibly aggressive, for them, the fun, their incentives and their um, uh, success is not quite the same. It's not perfectly aligned with your success. If they succeed in getting to financial close, they get paid, right? If they can get investors, they'll get their money out. If the project then gets built, sounds great. But if it turns out there isn't a market for eight or $900 hydrogen or ammonia, then Namibia, even if, even if you haven't invested the money, you won't lose the money, there will be a, a problem left behind if this big project fails. It's a, it's a big project for Namibia. Have you thought about what happens? What ifs if, if this thing gets built and then turns out to be not economically successful? Have you made sort of contingency plans? Because obviously the solar and wind capacity is great. Does the Namibian government take ownership of that? How does that work? Yeah, fantastic. So it's, I'd love to think it's unlikely we'll build it um, if if there's not off take right. So the next two years we're going to try and grant truth, uh, sort of a lot of your concerns, right? So um, the again, when you think of that off take, um, when you compare it to three four hundred dollar ammonia, that is diametrically opposed with the world's intent to decarbonize hard to abate sectors um, and the world's intent to survive and not you know, warm up the planet beyond one and a half degrees centigrade. Um, I'm not sure that product is viable. 
Yeah. And you're, you're hearing a lot of um, policymakers, funders, right? Because it's not just the policymakers we're talking to. We're talking to pension funds, BlackRock, uh, European Investment Bank. And they're saying three to four hundred dollar ammonia made from uh, hydrogen that's made using steam methane reforming, right? That's producing a ton of carbon dioxide using coal and natural gas. They don't want to buy that product anymore. So it's not just governments, it is funders as well. And you're seeing a lot of funders moving away from that product at that price point. And people are talking about not just cost of production, but, but cost of the planet. So it doesn't feel lonely, right? I've got to say, if you go to the farm belt, they're buying fertilizer. They're not talking about that. No. So, so I mean, the yeah. funder BlackRock may be saying that, but farmers in Iowa are not talking about that. Which is exactly why if you, if you looked at... Uh, our um, uh, our summer 2021 tour, we were not in Iowa, right? We, we you know, we were we China were not, too. I mean, we, go, go, go. so the world is an interesting place. If yeah. you look at what China, have you seen how much investment China is making into green hydrogen? I have. Have you seen the cost of their electrolyzers, right? Like 60, 50 percent cheaper than European electrolyzers, right? But China is pushing into green hydrogen more aggressively than the U.S. and almost uh, Europe combined, right? Because they believe that this is the alternative to, right, um, to, to, to gray, gray ammonia or gray hydrogen. More aggressively. I mean, I've been studying China for the past two, three years. The U.S. is a latecomer to this market. Right? You, you produced the IRA in August 2022 after a long battle in Congress. But even you have come up with subsidies, $3.00 a kilogram for yeah. gray hydrogen tax credits, right? Um, so the US is getting onto the bandwagon. Europe is two, three, four years ahead of you on this one. Uh, the German program has now become an EU program. So is it possible that we're going, that Namibia and or its private sector developers will build a project that ends up producing a product um, that is not marketable? I, I find that to be a little bit unlikely, given that we are not building the project uh, alone, right? We're building it with Germany and with the EU saying we're happy to offtake. You will not get money from a banker, even if they're BlackRock or whoever cares about climate change, if you don't have a bankable offtake, right? So is this project today like risk-free? No. And in fact, from what we are seeing, the risk is not predominantly slanted towards the financing and the commercials. It's actually slanted towards the fact that this project is going to be built in an ecologically sensitive area. Um, that is what most funders are actually concerned about. So they're worried about the, uh, the oryx and they're worried about the, uh, some of the, those, those rare plants like the velvicia and, and others. I mean, this is pretty... This is pretty dry, hot, dry, arid place, right? It's actually a UNESCO heritage uh, site as well, various parts of it, right? Um, and at the same time, it's also a, a very um, high biodiversity area and not just the big things that you can see, but there's some very rare succulents that are found in this area as well. And so, you know, the environmental uh, social impact assessment is going to be actually one of the biggest de-risking activities that we that we take. For people who don't know, this is this is a part of Namibia where there are all these plant species that there's no water anywhere, and so they get their water from the the dew from the air. Um, it's the it's the heating and cooling of the desert, and the plants have adapted there to get all of their moisture from the air. It's really extraordinary because there's never rain, almost never. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, it's, it's life in the extreme. It's really quite an amazing place. It is, but you know, it won't exist for very long if we don't do anything about it. Yeah. So I want to bring the audience in, but first let me ask yeah. you one question about the social aspect of this. There are lots of examples around the world of a boom. An $11 billion project in Namibia is sort of, talk about a boom town. This is, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's going to increase the population there more than by a factor of two, it's probably a factor of 10 when you add on all the ancillary services, the restaurants needed, and all of the other things needed. To, if, if there's 15,000 new workers and they have families and they all buy food and they eat in restaurants and they 
do normal life things, this is a big economic boom. I'm thinking about like, for example, a few years ago in the US, in North Dakota, one of our most sparsely populated states, one of the few I haven't actually been to, um, North Dakota is in the middle of nowhere and the Bakken opened up, big oil boom. Suddenly they were hiring people like crazy. And there were lots of articles on the trouble that came from this sudden boom and how it really destroyed a lot of towns, put enormous social pressure on the towns, alcoholism, prostitution, all this sort of stuff. Have you thought about that? Some $11 billion investment in these parts of Namibia, how do you prevent some of the, frankly, almost ubiquitous dark sides of sudden economic boom? Um, probably the second most relevant thing that we have to think very hard about. Um, you know, when, when we asked Ricardo to help us think about, you know, uh, turning around the Namibian economy, you know, I think with the growth lab, we started looking at areas that were not, one could say, too far from our expertise, and we were looking at improving various agricultural sectors. Um, this one project that you're looking at is now one of four, I think, multi-billion Namibian dollar projects. So after that roadshow and after we, we did this, there is a project called uh, HDF, Hydrogen de France. They want to uh, put together a hydrogen power plant that actually produces electricity um, and then feed that electricity into a small town. That, that project wouldn't have worked without um, a lot of grant funding from the EU as well. Right, but they're almost there now. They want to start construction; should be operational by 2024. The Belgians came out uh, when you saw me. At, you know, in Franz Timmermans, there we were in Belgium. They want to potentially build a liquid bulk ammonia terminal in Walvis Bay. Um, that's a two and a half billion euro dollar play. So that's 40 billion Namibian dollars. And then there's another project as well with the port. So, so not only have we thought about could this be a real challenge for the Karas region, the southern part of Namibia, that coastal region, the, the western area, the, the second uh, hydrogen valley, and the whole country as a whole is going to um, experience significant growth pains. And I think the Growth Lab had written extensively about this with regards to how should we be thinking about skills and skills attraction. Um, but as I mentioned during the presentation, it's, it's the real you know, I'm actually an immigrant. Hey, I, I wasn't born in Namibia. I came from Tanzania. Uh, my mom was a lecturer at the university. Um, so I went through the process the of, university. yeah, the University of Namibia where I got my first degree. I went through the pains of getting a study permit, getting a work permit, going to home affairs and being called an alien and then, and then, and right? And even now, as I work for the president, you know, there's some people who would still sort of say, but he's not Namibian. How, how is he the economic advisor to the president? Um, so you can imagine, you know, Namibia is a fairly conservative space sometimes. If you want to bring 100,000 people right across the country, not just in the Karas region, and they don't look like you, they don't sound like you, and you want to turn Namibia into California, Singapore, or London, or something like that, there is a huge social experiment that you're going to be undertaking. Absolutely. And of course, there's the pre-colonial identities that are you know, they're not all Namibian. I mean, it's correct. The tribal identities are still powerful in certain parts of the but country. But the best thing to do about it is to start talking about it today, which is what we're doing, right? So for example, you can see the scholarship program. It's not even a Namibian scholarship program per se alone. It's a European one. And we're trying to send the students out into Germany, out into Europe uh, for them to come back because traveling broadens the mind. Because when they do travel, they'll be problem solving for these very complex questions that you're asking me, along with other bright minds, but along with other cultures as well. And so we think that one of the best ways to, to face that challenge is head on today by being open about it, by talking about it, and by beginning to prepare every aspect or as many aspects as possible of the Namibian economy uh, to that reality. So construction, architects, uh, all sorts of different, you know, logistics is going to be huge. I think the developer said to me the other day, they foresee spending 2.5 billion euros on diesel. Right now, if you see the size of the wind blades, they're 100, and, right? 
meters long, and those are going to have to be transported from Walvis Bay down to. We've never done something like that. So, so the roads are pretty straight, at least. Well, this might need to come back to Namibia. Not, not so <laughs> the, the highways, maybe, but these things are not going to be on the highway. They will be on the dirt road between Swakopmund and, um, you know, so. There's a lot. There's a lot that we would have to learn. Uh, there's a lot that we would have. To, and we'll make mistakes as well. By the way, no doubt about it. Um, but taking these case studies from from North Dakota and and taking them into the Namibian classrooms and into the Namibian cabinet, so that the policymakers see the level of flexibility and ingenuity we would have to exhibit from a policy perspective would be absolutely invaluable. And it's one of the reasons I came all the way here from New York to Washington to here was to start actually absorbing what those would be like and to take it back to the structures that I just showed you, right? Because it is without a doubt an experiment that Namibia has never done in its uh, 30 odd years of being independent. I think very few countries have done this well. So you have a great challenge ahead of you. I got to say though, you are one of the most inspiring and optimistic. Well, I find your, your, your words incredibly optimistic and exciting for the future. So thank you for that. Um, I will also say uh, these other projects, frankly, to me are almost more exciting than the mega project because building any project like Pearl, like an $11 billion hydrogen project is really hard anywhere just doing it even when the price of your product is below the long-term average market price much less twice as high so this is really hard but the fact that you have smaller projects that you can learn from and develop along the way that to me may be more important than this mega project that is each one of these will make the namibian government and the whole ecosystem in namibia I don't mean the natural ecosystem, but the industrial and policy ecosystem, more sophisticated and more capable of handling the challenges you've mentioned. And there's probably at least half a dozen major challenges we haven't even anticipated that will come up. So very exciting. Let's, there's a lot of people here who want to say some things. So let's, let's hear from them and, and James can respond. Let's just go around. And if you could just brief, keep your question relatively brief and mention who you are and, and, and let's go around, start here. Uh, Hi, thank you. I'm William Jensen from Mexico, student here, and I've been working in green hydrogen for the past uh, three years. Uh, so my question is, what institutions are you creating from the Namibian, the Namibian government to actually facilitate all the deployment of this project and as well to facilitate the export of the green hydrogen? For instance, are you thinking about certification? So how to certificate that the hydrogen that you're producing is green and that it can be uh, traded uh, overseas? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that This speak. Yeah. Uh, this I, this. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of things. So I think right at the beginning, we set up a Namibian Green Hydrogen Research Institute. One of the reasons we did that was because we knew, you know, selling goods and stuff like that is great. But at some point in time, we want to start creating the IP at home so that we can try and capture more and more of the value uh, with the value chain. Um, so I think that's one institution that, that we are fairly proud of in terms of thinking about it early on. We've taken basically our two largest uh, tertiary institutions and I've asked them to come together to do that. And then they're busy forming partnership with other tertiary institutions around the world to champion R&D in Namibia. Because given those very unique conditions, you will get OEMs that would love to be testing, for example, their equipment in those conditions, ETC. Because um, the wind and the sun is one thing, but there's a lot of salinity there that can you know, really be harsh um, uh, on the equipment. Uh, we are putting together the Namibian Synthetic Fuels Act. Uh, so the piece of legislation 
and uh, we're working hard with the Europeans to think about um, certification and standards. I think the key thing we want to champion is the consumers, especially the Europeans, have come together, right? And they're putting together the EU Delegated Act. But the producers are just scattered, right? We're all just producing and hoping it meets there. But I think there's um, a utility in the producers also coming together and commenting on the Delegated Act together, right? To say, look, the things you're asking for are not really realistic. Um, and, you know, let's tweak this and this so that you can really get a broader potential supply source in order to make a liquid market versus always bilateral offtake agreement. So there's some work to be done there and very happy to work with you in Mexico to, to try and see where we can learn from one another. Okay, Henry. Henry de Bouquet, fellow from the Advanced Leadership Initiative. I'm a little bit from all over Europe and at the moment I'm a German taxpayer. Um, and I have some pretty good reasons um, to not, not have time to get into them to worry about the reliability, long-term reliability of these European offtake agreements. And so the question is, why not start with creating the ecosystem for just renewable electricity, which will come as part of a package, and do that instead of importing coal-fired electricity from South Africa? Isn't that a logical phasing? Yeah, good question. And you know, the truth is that's already happening. So Namibia introduced an MSB framework, uh, um, uh, essentially modified single buyer framework, which essentially meant we stopped relying on just our monopoly power utility to supply us with power. And so we actually opened up the renewable energy space and lots of IPPs came in first with five megawatt plants all over the country, then with you know about 20 megawatt power plants and now a 100 megawatt power plant has actually just been uh, sort of authorized. And then um, our NIRP, our National um, Integrated Resource Plan, is actually modeling 80% renewable energy from various independent sources and um, the, uh, the, the IPP and the uh, NAMPOWER. Um, and all of that has nothing to do with this project. 650 megawatts today. The NIRP is modeling it to about 800 or so. Um, we, we are modeling to get there over, over many 30 years, yeah. Right. So, you know, all of those efforts are happening independent of this. And then if you sort of, the one part I do agree with Dan is um, we were very proactive to go and get the pilot project money to get smaller projects going um, exactly to do that so that you're learning on, on small bite-sized things. So as much as we're doing this stuff on the renewables, we're also doing other things on adding value to things like iron ore. Uh, to start making hot brigaded iron, looking at fertilizer production, all that kind of stuff as well. Hi, my name is John Yasko. I'm a civil engineer from Arizona. Thank you for coming. And so I have similar concerns about demand, particularly with regards to Germany, because uh, as I understand, Germany is doubling down on their renewable energy production. And so my fear is that by the time that you get your operation up and running, Germany won't need the power anymore because it, it, it will be largely self-sufficient. He's shaking his head. Can, can you respond to that? Sure. All right, I'll, I'll leave him to that. But sure. my, uh, my main question is, like, do, you have, do you know of hydrogen plants lined up that will be like, more or less guaranteed uh, customers for this, uh, this green hydrogen product? Great. So um, Germany will not be able to make, according to them, right? Uh, and when you look at their own grid and their solar potential, they won't be able to make enough renewable electricity to decarbonize their hard to abate sectors, given their own solar profile and given their land availability by quite a bit. Um, so Germany and Europe have realized that they're going to have to import um, molecules from other places, Spain, Portugal, if, if you're in Europe, potentially North Africa, 
and then as far as field as as places like Namibia as well, right? So, you know, they've done, and not just Germany, but the EU have done these studies and, and they've realized, okay, we're, we're going to be net importers. The US might be self-sufficient. China over the long term will be a uh, uh, net importer. Australia net exporter, Japan and South Korea um, net importer, right? So, it's actually quite a global market and the demand isn't actually just power plants. If you think of South Africa and Sasol, uh, you know, they make synthetic fuels, including they're looking to make synthetic e-kerosene, for example, methanol, those sort of things, waxes. Um, and, and they're a huge, huge, huge emitter of carbon. And South Africa, for example, is looking to produce its own green hydrogen assets in Buhu Bay, uh, and they might be exporting some, but Sasol within South Africa would be would be an off-taker as well. So it's quite a dynamic market that is actually multi-faceted. And one of the things Namibia has now started doing is deepening and engaging our Asian. Uh, you saw us signing uh, MOUs with Japan and TICAD. We think Europe is a key market. We think Japan is a very interesting market as well. Um, and, and, you know, and, and then the one thing people always forget is Africa might be a market. You might be exporting this stuff into South Africa as well. I think our colleague at the back there is very familiar with uh, rolling power blackouts. Um, the president in South Africa actually put out a statement about four weeks ago saying, you know, we're in so much trouble now, we would actually like to consider importing electricity for the first time almost ever. And they cited Zambia and Botswana. Botswana would pre predominantly be coal-fired power. So if you can get these two terawatt hours uh, dispatchable at a reasonable price, you'd have a, a regional market for your electrons, not just a, an international market for the molecules. Let me just remind everybody, the capacity factor for solar is about 9% compared to 30%. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zipora. I'm from Kenya, and I'm interested in what you're talking about. So you've talked about the external analysis that's been done to make sure you can do this. But what about internally, the resources and capabilities Namibia will need, like the people, in, the skills you need to grow in Namibia to deliver this project and then to scale? Has that been done? And have you, because you're only 2.5 million people, so how has that been considered or factored in? Yeah, well, that's why we think we're going to need some of our Kenyan friends to come visit. Yeah. Um, you know, without a doubt, and that's where, you know, as quickly as possible, we have to become very objective about that reality. Um, and, you know, when we started having that conversation in Namibia, emotively, a few people, you know, people started rejecting that notion. Why? The U.S. has like record low unemployment, like 3%. We easily have 30% unemployment in Namibia. And youth unemployment is even higher, right? Like 40% ETC. So when you tell people that you will need to import skills, they're like, wait, 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 don't we just have like the high, like we need jobs. Why would you be importing? And I think some of the work that we're doing with, with the growth lab will help to, to, to bring some reality to that to say, look, sometimes you need 100 new jobs in order to create 1,000 or 5,000 new jobs. And you need to start looking at that objectively and from a from a data specific perspective. Um, and you know, all of those jobs, uh, some of them, some of the jobs that you'll have to import don't actually have to come from that far, right? So they could very well be people that look very familiar from Zim, from South Africa, from Kenya, etc. Um, but we, without a doubt, it is going to be one of the hardest things that we actually have to do. Um, but practically, what we started doing is putting in place local uh, programs like uh, and not just like phd or master's programs but also vocational training we've started putting in because you know putting up a green hydrogen plant isn't always about electro electrolysis and ammonia synthesis you have to dig a hole put a pipe put a pylon in put cement and put a solar panel and repeat thirty-seven thousand times Right, that is just a lot of construction work that is fairly of, sort of, of mundane. Core, yeah. core right. skills, so, yeah, yeah. So it's a portfolio, uh, but you need to start dialoguing with stakeholders as early as possible. Yeah. So James, I have one more question for you, and and you know my examples all come from the fossil fuel industry, but that's mostly where energy development has been for the last thirty years. And this is something interesting that happened in the U.S. between two thousand eight and two thousand fifteen during the shale gas boom in the U.S which was an extraordinary time. Um, started in Texas, moved to Arkansas and a few other places, and then finally into Pennsylvania. 
And when shale gas development happened in Pennsylvania, suddenly there were huge social problems. Lots of outcry, protests, anti-fracking, that started in Pennsylvania. And you could ask the question why, and no question there were some bad actors and some sloppy, but in general in Texas, 90% of the shale gas had come from Texas up to that point, and there were no problems. One of the explanations is that in Texas, in addition to the royalties that companies paid to individual landowners, there was a state law that mandated uh, investment in local towns and communities, money that went to building schools, building recreational centers. And so as a result, everybody in the community benefited, benefited from the economic development there. In Pennsylvania, they had royalties, but they had no economic mandate to invest in the local community. So as a result, landowners were getting rich in Pennsylvania with these gas companies, and the community was paying the price of pollution, lots of truck traffic, and, and they saw no benefit at all. They saw all the downsides of, of a big economic boom and no upside. You didn't mention that. And maybe, maybe that was in the rents, I couldn't quite tell, but have you thought about this to make sure that these projects, whether they're big projects or ginormous projects, will they invest more broadly in the economic development of the community, not just at the national level and not just at the individual landowner level? Well, and I hope there are so many people back home watching this, right? Because when we put out the criteria, because we developed the criteria to measure all the different proposals that we would, we would get, we had various um, line items that you had to fill. So how much equity would be available to the government, uh, free carry or equity to be, to be purchased, local jobs, local content, ETC. And one of the, um, the feedback or one of the proposals that we got was of uh, the conceptualization of the regional development fund. So the Karas region, right, is uh, one of the most sparsely populated, but also one of the most afflicted by unemployment and just lack of opportunities, right? Because it's dry, it's barren to see. Um, but also, in order to deliver such a project, you're going to need to up infrastructure development big time, right? Schools, hospitals, that sort of thing. Um, so this concept of a regional development fund, we thought was really, really interesting. And at the moment, there are conversations about how do we structure that? So the Namibian government will actually have a coal option uh, of up to 24% equity into this project. And we're negotiating that. Um, and the idea is, well, and that was to be held uh, you know, in the sovereign wealth fund. We've just created a sovereign wealth fund. And the idea was that potentially some of that could actually be then put in a, um, a regional development fund and the boon and the economic benefits of that would go into just developing the, the region. And of course, you know, at the moment, Namibia politically, everything is, um, things have changed. They, there's a, you know, a different political party that, that is predominantly sort of in power in the South, a different one in the West. You know, the main one is still sort of holding all the other regions. And so, there's going to have to be a lot of bilateral support for that policy or that concept because, you know, that one party might be for that and the main party might 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 have different views, right? So, um, and a lot of that is actually similar in Germany at the moment with the Green Party having taken a lot of power from the other incumbents. Uh, and so hopefully we don't find ourselves in a stalemate like the Democrats and the Republicans, but um, it is a very, very, very relevant topic that you bring up and it's something that, we're trying to problem solve for as early as we can. Well, listen, I think you will rarely find as exciting and sort of optimistic of you as you've just heard from James. And uh, um, James, I really hope you'll be able to come back regularly because as this plays out, however it plays out, I think we all want to hear about it. So we're very excited. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.